magnificent ocean liners and the women who traveled and worked aboard them. I'm Kathy Jones, one of the uh, reference librarians here at the Hudson Library. And before I introduce our guest tonight, I want to let you know that our next author program features Amanda Klutz. She is co-host of The Talk and the author of Live Your Life, My Story of Loving and Losing Nick Cordero. She'll be here next Wednesday, September 8th at 7 p.m. You can learn more about this program and sign up for this program and others at our website, which is hudsonlibrary.org. A uh, reminder that if you're watching us on Zoom tonight, you can feel free to put your questions in the Q&A at the bottom of your screen. We're also live streaming, live streaming, not streaming, on YouTube. So if you're watching us there, you can put your questions in the chat. Also, the Learned Al, our local independent bookstore, will be selling copies of tonight's book, and there will be a link to purchase one in the chat if you'd like to do so. So tonight, I'm delighted to welcome author Sean Evans, who is coming to us all the way from Wales tonight. Her new book, again, is Maiden Voyages, Magnificent Ocean Liners, and the Women Who Traveled and Worked Aboard Them. Maiden Voyages is an engaging and anecdotal social history that explores how women's lives were transformed by the golden age of ocean liner travel between Europe and North America. Sean is the author of several books, including Queen Bee, Six Brilliant and Extraordinary Society Hostesses Between the Wars. Her articles have appeared in many publications, including The Daily Mail, The Daily Express, BBC Antiques Roadshow Magazine, Coast Magazine, National Trust Members Magazine, and The Lady. A freelance film consultant for the National Trust, she has a Master of Arts in Cultural History from the Royal College of Art in London. Thanks so much for joining us in what is truly a late hour for you, Sean. We really appreciate your staying up late to chat with us. And so I'm gonna turn the program over to you now. Well, thank you, Kathy. It's a lovely introduction and, and what a welcome. Thank you. And thank you also to anyone who's watching. Um, appropriately enough, I'm coming to you transatlantically as it were from the west of Britain. And uh, I'm gonna be talking tonight about the, the book I wrote um, and which was published in America at the beginning of August. Um, this is The Lovely Maiden Voyages. I recommend it thoroughly. If I hadn't written it, I'd buy it myself. Um, it's an interesting book, I think, because uh, it looks at the history of women afloat, um, women as passengers, women as workers, uh, particularly the era between the two world wars um, and looking at the, the trade between uh, particularly the North American continent and Europe at a time when that grew exponentially, when people were traveling the world in unprecedented numbers. Um, and of course, a lot of those people were women. If you look at books written about these great ocean liners, they're normally written by men and they're mostly written about rather manly pursuits, such as um, the engineering, the technology, the horsepower, the crews, the daring do, the bravery, the, the technical wizardry that involved the launch and the design of the Titanic or the Aquitania or the Queen Mary. But there's very little written about the women who traveled on these ships. And I'd like to talk to you tonight about how I came across these stories. Um, it started off with a bit of family genealogy. Uh, my family all come from West Wales or Mid Wales, and most of my family would come from very humble origins. And the men in my family nearly all went to sea because that's what you did in the 19th and 20th centuries. You either, if you came from a humble background, you either went into the church or you might have worked as a farmer or a carpenter or a labourer of some sort or gone to work in the mines or the newly industrialised cities, or you could train as a merchant seaman and sail the world. Now, growing up on the coast of West Wales, a lot of my male relatives opted for the latter. And one family in particular, my mother's family, um, the Gronos, uh, we had one relative called Captain Stephen Gronow, who was born in 1872, tiny little place called Solver in Pembrokeshire, um, he and his brother were orphaned when they were quite young. Um, he, they both went off to train for the Merchant Navy. And um, by 1914, Captain Stephen Gronu, my grandfather's uncle, had joined Cunard, which was one of the biggest shipping lines in the world at that point. It was primarily 
plying its trade between Liverpool and later Southampton and the west coast, of, uh, the east coast of America, uh, particularly New York and Boston. It also went to, to Nova Scotia on occasions and Halifax. Um, Captain Stephen Grono, by 1914, had joined a lovely new ship called the Aquitania. The Aquitania had been launched in May of 1914 by Cunard. It was their new flagship. It was a beautiful ship and it was known as the Lady Ship. Um, as I dug into the history of the Aquitania, I discovered there was a reason for that. It had been designed particularly with women passengers in mind. The reason being that it was designed and launched only two years after the sinking of the Titanic. Now, Titanic sank in 1912. It was run by a, a rival shipping line called the White Star Line. And the Titanic was the massive great flagship uh, launched in uh, April of that year by White Star Line. And on it were, if you like, freighted all the hopes um, and ambitions of transatlantic shipping companies. It was the absolute bee's knees of its era. It was technologically very advanced. It was extremely luxurious. Um, and it was sent out on its maiden voyage and it crashed into an iceberg in the middle of the night. And as we know, a hell of a lot of people on it died, something like 1,700 people. Um, the ship, the, so great was the, was the shock after the, the Titanic sank that the shipping companies rethought their plans as to how massive ocean liners should look and how they should work. And my great uncle, who was already working on the Aquitania when it was launched in 1914, um, not only uh, a sort of, a, experienced, if you like, the, the, the fallout from, the, from, from the, 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 the fear that people had about traveling. But he also came up with something very practical, which was he invented a davit, which is a means of uh, launching a lifeboat. It's a kind of a hooky thing from which the lifeboats are launched. So that he, he patented a davit, which meant that the, the uh, lifeboats which were on the Aquitania were vastly improved and much less likely to launch um, unsuccessfully one of the problems which happened with the Titanic. So Captain Grono set, set sail on the Aquitania in 1914, and the Aquitania made a total of three journeys before um, World War I erupted in August of that year. Three return journeys. Uh, he was the chief officer on that vessel. Now, the thing about the Aquitania is that uh, Cunard had a fantastic poster at the time. Um, which looks like a slice. If you can imagine a slice through a gateau or through a wedding cake and you see all the different layers. This poster actually advertised the Aquitania and it shows very carefully the social hierarchy of what you might call just post Edwardian society. On the top deck, um, it's breezy, it's open. There are people who are very well dressed walking around Around, you know, um, just below them are the state rooms, as they're called. These are the private suites in which wealthy people would travel. The aristocracy, the extremely wealthy, um, millionaires, maharajas, they would travel in the first class, sort of underneath the, the, the main decks. Um, and they had servants and they had, as I say, suites of rooms, which is designed in historic style. A couple of decks down, you had the second class. Um, uh, accommodation. These are people who are very respectable and reasonably well off. They might be, um, let's say, I don't know, uh, they would they would be um, businessmen and women. Uh, they would be well healed. They would be people who've travelled frequently, quite often, across the Atlantic on business or for work or for pleasure. Um, and their rooms would look rather more like the rooms that you'd find in the Ritz Hotel at that era. So they are well appointed, uh, but they weren't quite so big as the grand state rooms up above. And then below them, below their dining room, below them would be the third class. Now, third class in the Aquitania was nothing like the horrors of steerage in the previous century, but it was still very much delineated um, for people who could only afford uh, a fraction of the ticket price of people who were sailing in the top top tiers, as it were. And these three tiers were quite carefully separated. So you can almost see the kind of the hierarchy of, as I say, Western society as, uh, as it would be in a small city. And this is one point I want to make about these great ships. They might have a thousand or two thousand people on board when they set off on one of these 
seven day journeys. Um, and within that, that ship, they have to be self-sufficient. They have to have all the manpower, and I use the word advisedly, that they would need. They have to have all the expertise, all the engineering skill. They'd have to have all the fuel they'd need, all the food, all the medical supplies. They'd have to be self-sufficient because at one point they would be at least 1500 miles from land in any direction. And the North Atlantic is a notoriously scary place to travel by ship. Um, a fact that the shipping companies were quite keen to keep from the uh, from the, the, their poor passengers. They were very keen to make sure that people didn't know just how scary a storm at sea could be in the North Atlantic. And so they made every possible effort to advertise these ships as being safe and comfortable and convenient and uh, well appointed. And one of the ways they did this was to design ships like the Aquitania so that the interiors, the architects were designed to create interiors for the public rooms and indeed the private rooms that made them look like country houses, English country houses. Um, there were two architects called uh, Mewes and Davis who specialized in doing historical, historicist interiors um, for places like the Ritz Hotel in London and in Paris. And uh, they were employed by Cunard to, um, to give these rooms inside the ship uh, a veneer, if you like, a pastiche of um, historical respectability to make them look above all terrestrial. So that the, the, the ladies who were traveling, particularly the ladies, um, despite what they could see out of the porthole, would be sufficiently convinced that they were in fact in a Robert Adams library um, in a nice country house over the weekend, rather than 1500 miles from the nearest landmass two years after the Titanic went down. So there's this whole kind of PR activity in the years just before World War I to convince people that going to sea again was safe and particularly to convince women. So I was looking at the women passengers who traveled on Uncle Grono's ship. I call him at Uncle Grono's ship, even though he's only the chief officer. And of course, I discovered that in an era where, you know, propriety was very important, um, you wouldn't have female passengers being looked after by male crew. So the stewards, the people who acted as sort of waiters or butlers or body servants, um, while they would happily go in and out of uh, cabins inhabited by men, it was really quite taboo for them to go into a cabin where a woman, particularly a single woman or two women traveling alone, might be traveling in case they were in a state of undress, in case they were sick, um, in case they were pregnant, uh, in case, you know, in case anything was wrong with them. Um, it was deemed inappropriate, unseemly for women to be attended by anything other than women. So while a decently, uh, a well-appointed woman on land might travel with her own maid or her hairdresser or her chaperone or the governess or the nanny or whatever, um, once these people were at sea, quite often those servants were also as seasick as the mistress. And this is where the stewardess comes in. The stewardess is a working woman who travels on these great ships, employed by the ship's companies, and she acts as a kind of um, a chaperone, a governess, a nanny, a maid, uh, a reassuring presence, a nurse if required. And she can advise the nervous female passenger on how to cope with seasickness or, or, or nausea or inability to sleep or how to use the chamber pots because of course not many of these ships yet had plumbing. Uh, she could help the maid, uh, she could help the mistress to dress at a time when um, most, it would be very difficult to get a woman into her corsets and her dresses um, in, in, on dry land, let alone in a bucking and, and rocking small cabin. This is where the stewardess's so-called sea knowledge um, came into great effect. Now, the women who worked as stewardesses, there weren't that many of them, but they go back as far as 1842. The first record I found is in Charles Dickens' account of his trip to America in 1842. He went on a lecture tour and he had a terrible time. He and his wife and his maid set out on, uh, on a ship, one of the early Cunard ships, um, and the, uh, the, the crossing was so rough, he spent something like 18 days thoroughly seasick and wet um, because the ship wasn't all that watertight and they were all very miserable. But about the only source of comfort was the, the stewardess. 
um, who came in with great plates full of food and encouraged them to eat and laughed and said, it's all fine, it'll be fine, don't you worry. It's always like this, take no notice. So stewardesses were working women who'd worked on ships from at least the 1840s, looking after in particular the female passengers and the children um, and couples and so forth. They tended to be in the early years uh, widows of sailors who had worked for that line beforehand. Uh, the, the, the chap had died, um, usually in the service of the shipping company, and his wife, his dependent, uh, needed to get some money together to look after her children. And so she would go to sea and she would uh, she, she'd get quite a good living uh, for a working woman. Um, it's quite respectable. Um, and she would get tips. And these tips kept many a household going in places like Liverpool and Southampton and the city of London and so forth. Women who had very young children tended to work as stewardesses doing the cross channel ferry run. Women who had, um, uh, who, who, whose children were a little older, they could leave them in the care of other relatives or their eldest children would do the transatlantic route. And that was much more lucrative. Some of them did route between uh, Ireland or Britain or France down as far as South America. And that brings us to one of my favourite characters who is called Violet Jessup. Now, Violet Jessup is a wonderful character. She features in this book. Um, she was born in 1888 of Irish parentage in Buenos Aires uh, in Argentina. Her parents had moved there in order to try and breed sheep. It was not a successful venture. Her father died. Violet was the eldest of about five children. And so Violet and her widowed mother and Violet's youngest uh, sisters and brothers came back to Britain um, and they needed money urgently. And Violet ended up being a stewardess. This is her first experience was to, to sail back from Buenos Aires to, to mainland Britain, but she then went to sea as a stewardess. Violet clocked up more than 43 years working as a stewardess. Um, she was very pretty. She had a slight Irish accent. There's a lovely photograph of her in the book. She was known as the unsinkable stewardess because she survived three major maritime accidents. The first one, she was on the Olympic in 19, uh, 1912, I think, 1911, when the Olympic um, a White Star Line ship uh, crashed into another ship. Um, that was survivable, fortunately. But in 1912, she was a stewardess on the Titanic and she was awoken uh, just after going to bed by the sound of the impact with the iceberg. And she and the room, the, her, her roommate, another stewardess, climbed up to their deck to look after their, their charges and found a state of chaos. And Violet was asked by one of the crew members to get into a lifeboat and was handed a baby she didn't know whose baby it was, handed a baby to show the other passengers how easy it was and how safe it was to get into a lifeboat. So she did that. And as a result, when the lifeboat was lowered and Violet and the other, the other people in her boat were set loose on the sea, um, they were lucky enough to survive, although she had a very horrible night, obviously, afloat, clutching this unknown baby. Uh, she wasn't very well dressed for it. By the time they got picked up by the Carpathia the next morning, um, Violet's arms were sort of frozen in a locked position and she had to be winched aboard the Carpathia in what's known as a bosun's chair, which is like a chair on a rope, if you can imagine it. And the crew of the Carpathia had to very gently open her arms to release the baby. Um, she never forgot the fact that she and the other people in the boat could hear as they drifted away from the Titanic, uh, the cries of people um, drowning or succumbing to hypothermia. Um, nevertheless, Violet, uh, within three weeks, was back on, on a ship working because she had no choice. She was a sole wage earner for her family and uh, rather cruelly, I think, um, White Star Line had stopped the pay of all the, the crew and all the stewardesses um, as soon as the ship went down. So by the time they got back to Britain, they were already two weeks without money and they urgently needed money. After Violet's second incident on, on board the Titanic, she trained as a nurse during World War I and she went to work on um, the sister ship of both the Olympic and the, Brit and the Titanic. It's called the Britannic, the Britannic, and it was a hospital ship. Um, and she was in the Aegean, uh, she was a very useful staff member because she was not only a stewardess who had worked on sister ships, but she was also now a trained nurse. Um, the ship was either torpedoed or hit a, a, an ice um, or hit a mine. Um, and the forward end of the ship started to sink 
as the captain attempted to steer the ship towards land, and the rear end of the ship came up with the propeller starting to spin out of the water, just at the point where people started to uh, very calmly evacuate the ship. And Violet was in a lifeboat, um, which was gradually sucked into uh, the, the backwash from these propellers. Uh, more than 30 people died because the propellers were churning like this and they cut up the boats. Violet had a nasty head injury and nearly drowned, but she survived again. And as I say, she went on, she recovered. She went on to serve for 43 years in total um, on board um, various ships because she had no choice. That was her life. That was her decision. And she was apparently an extremely brave woman. Um, World War One obviously was, uh, was, was horrific for many people. Um, but it was particularly bad for the Merchant Navy. My own uncle, Stephen Gronow, would go back to him. He, uh, having been in the Merchant Navy as a civilian, uh, as, a, as a, 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 he joined the RNVR, Royal Navy uh, Volunteer Reserve, um, when the war started. And uh, he left behind the Aquitania in order to um, captain um, ships, which were cargo ships full of munitions. One of them was called the Vinovia, that was a Cunard ship. And he sailed that from New York uh, back to Britain in December, 1917 as part of a convoy. And the Vinovia was, they were escorted by an armed ship, but the Vinovia was, was flagging. It, it drifted towards the back of the convoy um, just as it started to get dark. And it was a December afternoon um, and Captain Groner was in charge of the ship and it was losing power was laden with car a cargo of uh, brass and munitions. And as the light started to dim, and he could see the rest of the convoy heading up the English Channel, uh, leaving him slightly behind, they were still making progress. Um, his ship came into the sights of a German U-boat, which fired a torpedo. The torpedo hit the ship in the middle of the ship. Eight crew members were killed instantly. Captain Grana gave the orders for other crew members to abandon ship, um, which they did, but he stayed with the ship and he attempted to steer it into uh, the nearest port, uh, which is Falmouth, in order to try and save the cargo. And after four hours, um, he realized it was dark and he has no chance of, of saving the ship. And he literally stepped off the bridge into the water, um, wearing his uniform, uh, thinking that was it. And he prayed in Welsh. Um, and he thought of his wife, who was waiting for him back at home, and he hoped for the best, but he feared the worst. And the next morning, amazingly enough, a rescue party found him unconscious and clinging to the wreckage. And uh, the bit of wreckage that he was clinging to happened to have the ship's bell on it. So with the movement of the water, the ship's bell was going ding, ding. Ding, ding, and that's how they located him. They dragged him aboard their rescue ship. They dried him out, warmed him up. And uh, within another year, he was back working on, on the Cunard ships, having won all sorts of medals. So Captain Gronu is a bit of a hero, really, in a quiet way, like so many merchant Navy men and women who served in World War I. Now, we're cut now to the 1920s, because as soon as World War I ends, uh, there's been a massive hit to allied shipping um, of all sorts. Obviously you've heard of the Lusitania, I'm sure, uh, and the disaster that that was. I write about that quite a lot in the book. Um, by the 1920s, there's a huge demand for people to travel in both directions, particularly between uh, North America and Europe and Europe and North America. There's a, a, a desire for people to emigrate. Some people are running to the new world. Some people are running from the old world. Some people are desperate to, to create a whole new life for themselves. Uh, and you also get people coming from America who maybe served in the armed forces who want to know what, what's all this Europe thing about. You know, they, they, they saw a little bit of Paris after its liberation or they've visited Italy and they want to come and see it. And so there's an enormous amount of traffic in both directions. Um, the shipping companies rise to this, as you might imagine, um, and uh, ships like the Aquitania, which I kind of follow through this book, um, the Aquitania uh, is, is packed to capacity going in both directions. And um, you, you see photographs of it at the time, you see people dancing on the decks and above them on the open decks you can see plenty of lifeboat provision because people are still very nervous it's still a very scary business and we forget now you see I mean here we are it's now 70 years 
since really the invention of mass transportation by uh, plane. It's the mid 1950s when mass transportation by plane becomes a viable option for most people. And up until the mid 1950s, the only way to cross the world's giant oceans was by ship. There was no alternative. It didn't matter how seasick you were, how fearful you were, how much you disliked the idea. Um, if you wanted to travel the world, it had to be by ship. So many millions of people traveled in both directions on these great ocean liners. And the ocean liner companies were competing one with another. Um, in terms, obviously, of, of price, uh, there were still very affordable um, uh, tickets available for people who were traveling in third class. Um, but it also became rather a trendy and wonderful way to travel because once they'd solved the problems of stability of the ship and the way in which you know the, 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 the comfort of the cabins brought in electric lighting, brought in indoor plumbing, um, uh, hot and cold running water, Water and so forth, um, it became a much more luxurious way to travel. It wasn't as grim as it had been, certainly not in, in Dickens's day. Um, and people started to find it fun. Um, at the same time as you have the 1920s, the people traveling for need and traveling for pleasure, you also have one other factor, which I write about at some length in the book, which is prohibition. Now, everybody likes a party and um, in the early 1920s, um, alcohol, the sale of alcohol, was banned in America, which made it a, uh, a unique selling point for non-American non shipping companies because they were shipping large quantities of people from, let's say, Europe as passengers to, let's say, New York. Um, but while they were in port, um, they could make a lot of money by doing a quick trip, let's say, north to Nova Scotia or Halifax or down as far as Havana, they could do a booze cruise, as it was called, because once you got, first of all, three miles and then 12 miles off the coast of the States, um, non-American ships were allowed to sell liquor. And this was a huge draw. All of a sudden, you've got um, the idea of being on a ship as a leisure activity. Now, granted, that leisure activity involved parties and drinking a lot, um, but it was the start of what we now know as the cruise industry. And this gave the genesis to the shipping companies as to how they might make extra money, not just in transport, but in leisure, in fun, in pleasure, in entertaining people, in laying on things that people could do, whether it's playing cards or playing games or having gyms or having swimming competitions or, or teaching people to dive or whatever. All these things now became possible on ships, which were, if you think about it, extremely technologically advanced. These ships were the biggest items, the biggest man-made objects in the world at that time and, and still are. If you look at these enormous great cruise ships, there's nothing much bigger that moves than a giant cruise ship on this planet. And they were technologically cutting edge. They were absolutely extraordinary for their era. Um, now, not only were they lovely looking um, and technologically pretty, pretty nifty, but they also attracted, they had a, a, a glamour quotient, which again, I write about in the book. At the same time as you've got um, people traveling for need, people who, the sort of people who were household names only to their own households, you also get people who are stars, actors and actresses of the silver screen. You get people who are performers, you get um, uh, uh, wonderful singers and actors and dancers, you get Fred Astaire, you get Charlie Chaplin, you get people going backwards and forwards across the Atlantic as a matter of course because of their work and these were famous people. So if they were traveling first class and you were wealthy but you know, nobody very special, if you knew they were going to be on that ship, you could buy a ticket and go on the same ship as Charlie Chaplin or um, uh, Tallulah Bankhead um, or Noel Coward. You know, you could be sitting at the next table from them for five or six nights and you'd get a chance to observe the Prince of Wales eating his dinner in the in the uh, the American tradition of only using his fork. Or you might notice that Charlie Chaplin liked to read historical novels over over his meal or you might notice that that uh, uh, you know that uh, Marlena Dietrich was a little later obviously in the 1930s 
was um, uh, was particularly good at doing the tango. You would you would know this because you'd seen them in action close up at an era when fame was suddenly becoming really important through the cinema uh, and through the mass uh, mass media. This was a way of suddenly getting proximity to celebrity was taking an ocean trip. So it became a hip and trendy thing to do, and it became very glamorous. And you get the symbiosis between um, the movie industry, if you like. Movies started being made about life on ship at the same time as the ships started to become far less about historical style interiors and far more about Art Deco, Odeon style, glamorous settings like you'd see in the movies. So the one feeds off the other. And to travel by ship becomes a very fashionable thing to do. Um, so much so that the ships are designed to show off particularly women at their most glamorous. So you get what's called La Grande Descente as a matter of course on most of the new ships being built, particularly the French ones and the American ones. This is where you have a set of steps, a beautiful set of steps, maybe in a spiral or a grand sweeping set of double steps, backlit, mirrors, glamour, you know, flowers the works um, sweeping down into the main dining room in first class so that well well clad ladies and gentlemen could make a grand entrance and believe me they did because you were on show it was very theatrical you would be dressed up to the nines if you were traveling in first class but you'd be fashionably dressed you'd have a different different evening dress for every evening of course but you just have lots of outfits during the day so to be on a ship became a very fashionable thing to do and it became the acme of appearing fashionable now for some women this was a great opportunity for a career move so somebody like um um uh, Hedy Lamarr, uh, who became a transatlantic star. Uh, she was actually from Austria. She ran away from an unhappy marriage to an arms manufacturer called Fritz Mandel um, and in 1937. She ran away from him because she didn't like the cut of his jib and the people he was keeping company with, uh, particularly the Nazis. Uh, and Hedy was of a uh, Jewish background. She managed to get away as far as London. She chatted to um, uh, Louis B. Mayer, who she met there through friends, she hoped he would sign her up for a film contract, but he only offered her a desultory sum of money. She and she turned it down, but she found out that he was traveling back to America on the Normandy, a French ship, a very smart French ship. And so, what she did was she booked herself a cheap ticket on the Normandy. She had very little money, but she did have a fantastic wardrobe and some fabulous jewelry. And every night, she would make La Grande Descente down into the restaurant, sweeping down um, this wonderful staircase on the arm of some well-heeled bow, sweeping past uh, Louis B. Mayer and said, good evening, Mr. Mayer, Mr. Mayer, and um, on onto her table. He was so struck by her star quality that within six days of them leaving Cherbourg, uh, he had signed Hedy Lamarr um, as a, a major Hollywood star and she arrived in New York, him having cabled ahead to say, you know, we have a new, a star is born, literally, in the course of a transatlantic voyage. So that was Hedy Lamar, and her story is, um, is a lovely one. Um, Marlene Dietrich was another person, uh, another star who constantly traveled backwards and forwards on the so-called Atlantic ferry. And Marlene Dietrich, who's always immaculately turned out, um, she knew the value of good publicity. Um, and she would play along with Cunard or White Star Line uh, or American Lines, whoever was the uh, the, the owner of the, the, the shipping line. She would always appear immaculately dressed on board the deck and she would pose for photographers, press photographers, but also the in-house photographers. Um, this was, again, an example of symbiosis. It was an early example of PR in that women who who, who, who appeared glamorous and beautiful and had their photographs taken on these ships thereby um, their images were used, and so they knew this was happening, their images were used in order to promote travel by ship to make it appear more glamorous. It also gave the newspaper men um, some lovely photographs of, of fantastic stars, star quality, um, to run in their newspapers. So whenever a great big ship arrived at either New York or Liverpool or Southampton or Cherbourg or Boston, um, the ship would be uh, um, met by um, a small tender full of um, 
of journalists who were called the gangplank willies. These were photographers and news journalists who would get onto the ship before the ship actually docked and they would track down whoever was the most famous, most glamorous person. They'd take photographs of them, they'd interview them and of course they had plenty of copy for the next day's papers. So to say, there's a kind of symbiotic relationship between the gangplank willies, the newspapers, the shipping companies, and indeed the stars. Um, one other person I'd like to mention in this context is Lady Astor. Um, she was uh, American born, uh, but she married a, a, a British chap who had been an MP. Uh, and when he was no longer allowed to be an MP, she became the first woman member of parliament ever to take her seat in the House of, House of Commons in 1919. Um, she was a remarkable woman. She was what you might call an Atlanticist in that she really believed in the special relationship between Britain and America. And she did her utmost to, to go between both, both places um, and, and build on that special relationship. She had a, an unparalleled position as um, uh, both a society hostess, I covered her in my book, Queen Bees, um, and also um, as a sort of a, if you like, an informal ambassador, both for women. She was uh, an early tub thumping um, feminist. She did it by by um, by example rather than by uh, ideology. Uh, and she was an amazing character who was extremely brave during World War II. She was the MP for Plymouth um, in, in uh, the west of England, which was very badly bombed during World War II. And she sat it out down there. She could have been at her country place, um, uh, which is much safer, um, but she chose to, uh, to, to, to live with the people of Plymouth and make major efforts to help defend them. Uh, talking of World War II, I'm going to bring it to a, call, uh, a, a pause shortly because there's so much I could talk about, but talking of World War II, we talk about, I've talked about these ships as being means of transport, um, a means of leisure, a working place for lots of working women. Um, by the time of World War II, there were not only stewardesses employed on board, there were women working as hairdressers, uh, restauranteurs, as nurses, as nannies, as instructresses for things like swimming. Um, you had social hostesses. Uh, you started to get people working as stenographers, that's typists, as it were. Um, you get people working in the purse's office, again, who are women. The, the great big ships provided a, uh, an opportunity for women from not very grand social backgrounds to go and lead independent lives um, and to make money for themselves, often with good tips, and to travel the world um, at a time when independent travel for women wasn't all that easy. So I've talked about the ships in this way and the women who worked on them. World War II kind of pulled the rug out from under all that. And very few women were allowed to work during World War II on the ships. But I have written about the ones that did. Uh, and some of them were extraordinarily brave. Um, immediately after World War II, of course, these great ships, which are being predominantly used for passenger ships, they've been used as troop ships during World War II. And they ended up um, uh, being used to take back the displaced people of all sorts from all around the world. So they picked up uh, prisoners of war who had been um, uh, imprisoned in, in the wrong country, basically, uh, as a result of war. Um, for example, my, my own great aunt, uh, my aunt Margaret, had been taken a prisoner uh, by the Japanese at the fall of Singapore in 1941-42, and she'd spent three and a half years in Changi prison of war camp, and she was liberated in 1945 and was brought back to Britain on one of these great big passenger ships. Um, there were also uh, people who were escaping the horrors of, um, uh, of, of occupied Europe, who were seek seeking new lives, uh, particularly in America. America was, was good to people from the, these awful backgrounds who'd experienced terrible things, America and Canada, it must be said. And then, of course, there were the GI Brides. Um, and the GI Brides, GI stands for General Infantry Man, as you probably know better than I do. And the GIs were um, allied troops, mostly from America and Canada, but also from um, other places such as Australia and New Zealand, who uh, came over to um, Western Europe prior to and following the D-Day landings. And they got to know a lot of the local girls, inevitably. Curiosity led to proximity and proximity led to pregnancy, as it were. Um, and something like 75,000 GI brides left Britain for America and Canada uh, in the immediate wake of World War II. 
Um, some of them had a baby already. Others were married and expecting a baby. And um, they piled onto these what have been former luxury passenger liners, babies in arms and, and, and whatever they could mass together to go and live new lives with these men who they barely, you know, barely knew, really. They'd met them, they'd married them, fall in love with them. They had children with them and all this. And they hadn't probably spent a lot of time with them, but they were prepared to give it a go and get on board these ships and, and sail again. So I'd like to leave you with the images of the, the, the GI brides heading for a new life, particularly from, from, um, from, from Britain, uh, going to America and, uh, and Canada. And as one described them, described herself, she said she was homesick, lovesick and seasick. The North Atlantic was still pretty tricky to cross if you were prone to mal de mer. So I'm going to wrap it up there if that's okay with you guys. And um, and if you'd like to ask questions, I'll be very happy to try answering them. Well, I, having read your book, I can say that even with all that wonderful information to share with us, you've barely scratched the surface of <laughs> what, what is in the book. There are so many wonderful stories about um, different women and, um, you know, famous women, not famous women, um, just in some incredible stories. And um, I think that um, the first question I wanna ask is about a woman who has a very unfortunate name, but is mentioned several times in your book, um, Edith Sourbutts. I, know, I, if you could, name. I know, it's just <laughs> awful. But um, could you just tell us a little bit about her? Cause I think she's really interesting. I'd love to. Edith Sourbutts is one of the, the unsung heroines of the 20th century. I found, her, um, her typewritten manuscript in the Imperial War Museum in London. She is a woman who was uh, feisty and fun, and she earned a living as a stenographer um, prior to World War I, and she got very bored as a typist, but of course it did give her a living. You could travel the world if you, were, if you had a, a, you know, a portable typewriter and a, um, a, 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 a healthy attitude sort of thing. Edith became a chaperone, uh, which is known as conductress, on um, a particular line, the Blue Star Line. Um, and her role was to accompany uh, unaccompanied women um, and children and to look after their moral and, and physical welfare on board these ships as they crossed predominantly from um, Europe to uh, Canada and North America, uh, to, to the USA. Um, and she, her, her accounts of her tales are remarkable. What she called the white, what was known at the time as the, the white slave trade, which was rather a, you know, sort of a clutch your pearls kind of tr uh, term, was what we now call sex trafficking. And there was an astonishing amount of it. Um, young women and, and, and children were indeed lured into a life of crime and vice. Um, by unscrupulous people um, who would pick them off when they arrived at the far end or might even solicit them on board the ships. Uh, and so Edith's job was to look after these, these women. And she was fantastic at it. She was very funny, she had a great sense of humor. Um, she stood up for, uh, for her charges, uh, often uh, coming into conflict with the male crew members who didn't see why people from you know, less privileged backgrounds should, uh, particularly women and children, should have um, the sort of care that she was giving them. But she was a very feisty person. She got made redundant, unfortunately, during the Great Depression, but she signed on again in 1936, working on board the Queen Mary as a stewardess. And this is a very different life for her because she was working first class and she was making a lot of money. And Edith and her slightly ditzy sister, Dorothy, uh, made a very good living out of being um, stewardesses. Um, up until the start of World War II. In fact, Edith was on the Queen Mary, along with Bob Hope and Albert Einstein. I mean, what a, what a conversation that would have been. Can you just imagine? Um, when World War II broke out, they were en route to New York when World War II was declared. Uh, she was sent back to Britain. Um, she went to work for a charity, um, evacuating children uh, to North America. Um, and unfortunately, a, a tragedy happened involving one of these ships. And she didn't go to sea again after that. She, she found it too distressing. But her, her life is so life enhancing and so feisty and such um, such a gripping read. I can thoroughly recommend that uh, despite the terrible uh, surname, Edith Sauerbutz, she she's a woman you'd like to get to grips with, I must say.
Right. She's fascinating. Um, another yes. person, you mentioned several other people that I think are, mm -hmm. you know, stories that, you know, probably nobody knows until they read your book. But um, one of them was um, Mary Ann McLeod. Oh, yes. <laughs> Little Mary Ann, or rather tall Mary Ann, as, as it turns out. She was five foot eight, which was tall for the year. Mary Ann McLeod was born on the Isle of Lewis in 1912. And um, in 1930, there was a brief loosening of the restrictions on the number of people who could go to work in America. Uh, the immigration rules were relaxed slightly. And Mary Ann followed her older sister's example and got on a boat to go to New York, claiming that she was a domestic servant. Um, and she had a small amount of money. She had been born on a croft. She was the youngest of 10 children. Um, they, were, they, were, they were extremely poor. A croft is one of those uh, tiny little farm holdings, you know, like a small holding, uh, barely enough for, for a few people to make a living on. So Mary Ann was looking to, to you know, to, to get abroad and, and, and make a proper living because the island of Lewis was extremely depressed and there were no opportunities for her. And she arrived in New York in, uh, in 1930 and she went to a party with her sister and she met a local uh, real estater real estate um, uh, chap who had his own business and Rita, she married him. And that chap was, uh, was Frederick Trump. So Marianne McLeod mar married Frederick Trump and had five children, the fourth of whom was Donald Trump. So if Marianne McLeod had stayed at home, uh, Donald Trump might not have happened. There's a thought. <laughs> Interesting story, yes. And another person that I thought was totally fascinating was Victoria Drummond. Yeah, who was an engineer. Great. She was amazing. She was one of the first, I think she was the first ever qualified female marine engineer, uh, certainly in Britain, uh, certainly the first one to go and serve at sea. And she worked on the ships, um, on, you know, marine ships. She was a qualified engineer, sort of working down in the boiler room. Um, and she, uh, during World War II, she managed to save the ship that she was on. Um, from uh, it was being dive bombed by a German bomber, um, and uh, it, it had very little uh, fuel left and very little, very little speed. Speed was what you needed to avert the the trajectory of a, a, a plane coming down. And she managed to, through sheer per force of personality and knowing the engines, managed to just coax enough uh, effort out of the engines for them to just constantly miss. Uh, or constantly be missed by the missiles being fired by this German airplane. And even though she was sort of surrounded by bits of ammunition um, and, and covered in oil, um, she survived and the ship survived. Um, and she got, I think she got the military cross for it. She certainly got a massive medal for it. And she was, she was quite a, a remarkable character. Her grand, her godmother was Queen Victoria. So she came from quite a privileged background, which probably enabled her in a way to do this kind of thing. But even so, it was considered to be a completely eccentric thing for a woman to do in the 1920s, to train as a marine engineer and to go to sea. Can you imagine the horror? <gasps> Happens all the time now. <laughs> yeah, I can't imagine. Was she, I mean, she was probably the only woman that in that time that would have done something like that. She was completely the only woman to be working in an engine, in an engine room uh, during World War II. Although lots of women did work on the ships and lots of women stowed away on the ships during World War II. I mean, you do have, uh, there was a, there were female doctors working on ships during World War II, um, female stewardesses. Um, and you also get, of course, the, the wonderful Martha Gellhorn, um, mm. uh, the, the American born foreign correspondent um, uh, and writer who, having survived a marriage to Ernest Hemingway, uh, managed to get on possibly the most dangerous ship afloat in order to get to Britain. She, she went on a, a Norwegian ammunition ship. Um, which was just absolutely stacked to the, the decks with ammunition um, in order to get to Liverpool, where she picked up another ship, a hospital ship, and she, she snuck aboard and disguised herself as a nurse so that she could be at the D-Day landings in Normandy uh, in order to be able to file her story. You know, that takes immense courage and guts to, to do both those things. So a lot of these stories are tales of women who um, who were... I wouldn't say, you know, I wouldn't say they were recklessly courageous, but they were, uh, you know, they say definition of courage is to feel the fear and do it anyway. They, they, they took their lives in their hands in order to do what they wanted to do. And that involved a lot of dangerous ocean travel. Indeed. And you mentioned the word stowaway, talking about Martha. Oh. There's an, another story in your book about a, a German stowaway who hid in the gravel. 
that's remarkable, isn't it? This woman, yeah. she had been prior to World War One. She was German. She had been a stewardess and um, for, for a German line. I think it was a Hamburg America line. And um, so dreadful was the financial state of Germany. Um, uh, at the end of World War One, by the 1920s, unemployment was rife, and the the market uh, uh, massive um, uh, uh, what you call inflation. So that you know you need a wheelbarrow full of marks to buy an egg, that sort of thing. And she had an elderly mother and a brother, both of whom were ill, and she was the only wage earner, and she just couldn't earn a living. And so she thought her only way of doing it was if she could get to America, where she had some cousins. She could probably earn some money to send back, but she couldn't afford the F, the the fare. Um, and so she she stowed away a ship. <clears throat> Excuse me. She she managed this because she knew the layout of ships, having been a stewardess. She got into the hold, and the hold is a the bottom bit of the ship, which is like a double hull. And you have um, uh, in order to keep it stable, it's full of gravel as ballast. Okay, you know, tons and tons of this stuff. It looks like road chippings, and. Um, she managed to get in there, she called Christina, she managed to sneak in when no one was looking and hide herself in the gravel, pulling the gravel over her and, and just waited for the ship to sail. And after what she estimated was five days, which meant she was more than halfway to America, she, she got out of the gravel and started banging on, the, uh, on the, one of the, uh, the, the, the hatches and thank God she was heard. Um, and she was pulled out absolutely filthy. She'd taken some food in with her and some water, but by this time, obviously, both supplies had, had run out. She was heard and she was rescued. She was dragged out filthy, dirty, and she was allowed into America um, because she'd just been so staggeringly brave and taken such a risk. She might never have been found, or if there'd been a storm, she could have been mashed to bits by the gravel, you see, with it all, you know, moving around like that. But amazingly, it's, it's astonishing what people would do in order to travel the world. If they couldn't do it by orthodox method, methods, they'd do it by unorthodox methods. Phenomenal story. Um, I have one more question for you sure. before we, we end our program tonight. Um, curious to know about your research on this book. You know, mm. how, how did you find all these stories and how long did it take you to research and to write the book? That's a good question. Um, I started, as I say, through purely through interest in a, in a family member. Um, and I would say probably took about two or three years in total, um, about two years of research. Uh, we have some fantastic archives in this country, as you do in the States. You have the SSFHA, I think, which is fantastic for, for information on steamships. Um, but we have um, the Cunard archives are held by the University of Liverpool. Um, so I went and spent a lot of time in the special collections of the University of Liverpool. Um, Imperial War Museum, um, you look at people's, you look for sources, and of course, most of these stories are written by women um, in diaries, letters, unpublished accounts. That's what makes them different. I mean, yes, anyone can write about Marlene Dietrich sitting on a taffrail and waving. Um, but you need to find the actual, you know, the, the verbatim accounts of what it was like. Uh, I read a lot of old newspapers, hence the story about the Christina, the, um, uh, the German stewardess who hid in the gravel. Found that in the New York Times as a, as a news story. Um, one thing leads to another, I find. You, you, there's a kind of a serendipity that you get going. And of course, you, you find a lot of dead ends, Kathy. This happens. You know, you, you look into something and you think, well, that's quite interesting. Does it go anywhere? Is it, how am I going to tie this all together? And then I kind of lay it all out as a kind of a linear uh, progression. This book is written chronologically largely because it was the only way to do it. Um, but as I say, the different themes kind of drop in in different sections. They suggest themselves as you go along. Um, and so it's a little bit like writing, if you like, a stage play in that you have, you have a couple of characters who run throughout. You've got the Aquitania, that goes from 1914 through to 1950. You've got Violet Jessup, her 43 years. You've got Edith Sauerbutz and her, was it 20 odd years afloat and what happened to her afterwards. Um, you've got other characters popping up like Hedy Lamarr, uh, Wallace Simpson. Um, you know, you have these people who, who come to the front of the stage and then recede as their stories. But fundamentally, what it's all about is, is, is the ships. You know, this liminal life that people had on board ships. When you're on a ship, you're six days away from your own life. And anything can happen on a ship. And that's what I thought was really fascinating. It's not just the 
ship itself. It's the fact you're in a state of transition from one world to the next. Even if you do this five times a year, you are still in a state of limbo. And that's what fascinated me most. Well, you've written a really fascinating book. And, and honestly, um, the things you've talked about tonight are, you know, have barely scratched the surface of what you have in the book. <laughs> a lot There's in so that. much to absorb and enjoy about this book. Um, it's, it's a great read. So I recommend it. Um, here, here it is for all our patrons. Um, we do, of course, have it at the library, also available for purchase. And there's a link in the chat, as I said before, if you'd like to purchase from the Learned Owl. So, um, but on behalf of everyone here at the Hudson Library and Historical Society and all our patrons, I'd like to thank you, Sean Evans, for being with us tonight and um, look forward to talking to you again when your next book comes out, hopefully. Thank you so much, Kathy, and bon voyage, everybody. Happy <laughs> traveling. <laughs> Bye, everyone. Do take care. Bye-bye now. Thank you. Bye-bye. Press Lee.